Welcome back to session five of our study of 1 Samuel. We're going to be looking in this session at 1 Samuel chapters four through seven. And this is a little bit of a different type of narrative than what we've already become accustomed to so far in the first chapters of 1 Samuel. Uh, this next portion of the story, really most of it relies on no major human character and no substantial human action. And yet, as you'll see, there are some certainly important truths for us to see in this narrative about not only ourselves, but the God whom we serve. And so what I want to do is to break this down into two kind of simple sections. I want to ask what happens, and we'll just look at the order of events, because this is a longer portion of text. We're not going to read the whole thing, and so I'll read portions of it and summarize others. And then after we look at what happens, we'll just ask the question, what do we hear? And then uh, maybe we'll ask one more question there at the end. So when you're looking at this portion of the narrative, really there are, are uh, six major events that structure what's taking place. And the first thing that happens is a battle. It's a battle uh, at a place called Aphek. And so let's just pick up and read the introduction to this section at the beginning of chapter four and, and note some things. It says, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. This is their antagonist, their enemies throughout the whole book. We've seen so far that there are some problems within Israel and the leadership, but we are going to find as we go that there's this consistent external aggressor of the Philistines who are really in many ways the ones who bother Israel during this whole period of their history. They are these uh, the settlement of five cities, each of which had their own little ruler king, and they dwelt in the land of Canaan, more on the westward side, and they consistently threatened to encroach upon Israel's territory, which would have been, of course, super bad for Israel. So the Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek, that's the city. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. When the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. Okay, so let's know what happens. They, they go to battle and it's not going well. And so they decide that there's something wrong. Why did we lose? And, and their solution is to go to Shiloh and get the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, if, essentially it was a box. It was a box that looked like this, only, only much bigger. It would have been about four feet long and, and two feet wide and probably about a foot and a half tall or so. Those are approximate. And it was certainly a very important emblem for Israel. It was really their most sacred object uh, in the Old Testament. And you'll note that this little um, model here is gold, and that's because it was made out of acacia wood, and it was covered with gold. And, and you have these various components, all of which are significant. It's actually um, got these rings on the bottom of it that you would slip these poles through, and you'd put poles in there to carry it because nobody was supposed to touch the Ark of the Covenant. It was sacred. It was holy. If, if you touch it, you're doing an inappropriate thing with God's holy presence, and so you would very likely die. And, and on the top here, you have this cover. And on either side of the cover are the cherubim, which are these angels, again, signifying God's presence. God's presence goes where this thing goes. And in the middle is the called the, the mercy seat, or in Greek, it would come to be called the, the hilosterion. In Hebrew, it's the word from which we get kapur, the idea of atonement. And so the, the blood of the atoning sacrifices would be presented here, and it would be the place where God offers forgiveness for the people. And so this was um, central, again, to their worship. Inside the thing were some important emblems from Israel's history, the stone tablets on which God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, and Aaron's staff that budded. And it would go on to actually be in the very centerpiece of the temple whenever they would construct this in the future. They don't have a temple at this point, but it, it, it still, nevertheless, is once more central to their worship. And they figure if we go get this, then maybe we'll win. Maybe the problem is that God, his presence is not with us. And so if we bring the Ark of the Covenant, his, his presence will be with us again. And there, there's some precedents for this. There are some important moments in Israel's history that help us understand why they thought this would bring them victory. Um, before this time, generations previously, when God's people had, they'd been delivered from slavery in Egypt and they'd made their way through this 40 year journey in the wilderness and they'd come up around and they were ready to enter into the land of promise, to enter into the land of Canaan. And they came up to the Jordan River and the water was flowing and you can't cross a flowing river. And God told them, Here, here's what I want you to do. I want the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant to step out into the water. And when they step out into the water, I will help you through. And so they stepped out in faith and, and the waters parted and the priests holding the ark with these poles stood out there and, and all the people walked across on dry ground. And then the priests came out and the waters flowed. Soon after this, it also played a role in the famous story of the fall of Jericho. You know, the one where the people marched around the city seven times and then blew the horn and, and the city was thrown into chaos and God's people were victorious. Well, it specifically says in the book of Joshua, blow the horn before the ark of the Lord. 
And so they figured, man, this is this is going to bring us victory. And so they, they take it with them, but it actually doesn't do what they think it's supposed to do. Now, the Philistines hear about this because the Israelites are shouting and they're excited and, and they hear rumors that the ark is here. And this terrifies the Philistines because they've heard the stories of what God did to the Egyptians. But they stand strong and fight. And here's what happens. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died, just as God said they would. And so the battle of Aphek does not go super well. And it's followed by the second scene in the narrative, which is essentially the end of Eli. Eli is officially out. After this battle had taken place, there was a Benjamite who made it through the battle and, and he runs home and he tells Eli, Here, here's what happened. And he tells him that we've lost the battle and your sons are both dead and the ark of God is captured. And as soon as Eli hears that the ark of God is captured, he falls over backwards in his chair and dies. And we're told this interesting detail in the story that Eli was a very heavy man. And this reminds us of the corruption of Eli and his sons who used to help themselves to the, to the food, to the meat that was designed to be devoted to the Lord. And so Eli comes to an end with this reminder of the problem of his reign. And, and then one of his daughters-in-law, married to one of the you know, men who just passed away, who just died in this battle, gives birth to a child. But there's no joy with this child, unlike with Samuel. And it doesn't receive a name that speaks of God's promise. It, it's given a name that speaks of God's absence. It's named Ichabod, which means the glory is gone. It has departed. And so this is the end of Eli's time. And yet it's not the end of the story. In this next uh, portion of the story, we'll call it the Ark versus the Philistines. We'll, we'll go with the Phils for short. It's pretty interesting to, to know what happens next. And so the, the Philistines have captured this sacred emblem of, of Yahweh, of Israel's God. And so they, they do what you would expect. They take it and they place it in the presence of their God, Dagon. And they, they put it in this place where they would go to worship Dagon or Dagon. And, and they leave it there. And this is designed to show all the people, look, our God is so much more powerful than, than all the others. And, and he's given us this great victory. And, and, and look at how wonderful we are and how wonderful he is. And then they come back the next day. And the problem is Dagon has fallen down on his face. Now, this is not just a matter of humiliation. This is actually Dagon laying thrust prostrate before the Lord. He's, he's worshiping the Lord. He's showing deference to the Lord. And it's kind of embarrassing, but they have to pick their God back up. And, and then another day goes by and they come back in and he's fallen on his face again. And now he's been dismembered. And, and not only is their God actually being dismembered by the presence of this Ark of the Covenant, but in a more practical concern, they're finding themselves afflicted with tumors all over their body in this Philistine city of Ashdod. And so they're like, you got to get this thing out of here. And so they send it to Gath, which is another Philistine city. And, and the people there are afflicted with tumors and they like, got to get this thing out of here. And they send it to Akron. And, and in Akron, those people are covered with tumors. And so every place the ark goes, these people find themselves under the judgment of this God whose presence is symbolized by this, by this box. And eventually they're, they're, they're looking at each other going, well, what are we going to do with this? And we'll pick up the story in chapter six, uh, chapter six, verse three, they've asked their priests, we want to get rid of this. We want to get this back to Israel, but we want to make sure we do it in the, in the proper way. And so in verse three, the priests tell them, if you return the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it back without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Acknowledge your wrongdoing. Then you will be healed and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. And so the Philistines ask, what guilt offering should we send? And they say, send five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. And so they, they send the ark back in this interesting way that you can, of course, read about in the text. And, and they put, some, put it on a cart and they attach the cows to it. And they say, oh, we're going to send it off. And if it does what we think it's going to do and just kind of meanders around, then we'll know it was just coincidence. But if it goes back to the city of Israel, then, then we'll know that this is actually God having brought his judgment upon us. And that's precisely what it does. And it approaches this Israelite city of Beth Shemeth. This is chapter 6, verse 13. Now the people of Beth Shemeth were harvesting their wheat in the valley. And when they looked up and saw the ark, they rejoiced at the sight. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemeth, and there it stopped beside a large rock. So the people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord together with the chest containing the gold objects and placed them on the large rock. And on that day, the people of Beth Shemeth offered burnt offerings and made sacrifices to the Lord. The five rulers of the Philistines saw all this and then returned that same day to Ekron. So this is a great celebration. The Philistines have demonstrated their acknowledgement of wrongdoing, and, and so they're cleared of the problems with the ark being there, and now the ark is returned to Israel. But not all is well, because here at Beth Shemesh, this 
this celebration is, is actually followed by some, well, some pretty unfortunate things. In verse 19, it says that God struck down some of the inhabitants of Beth Shemeth, putting 70 of them to death because they looked into the ark of the Lord. The people mourned because of the heavy blow the Lord had dealt them. And the people of Beth Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? And so they sent messengers to another city, Kiriath Jerim, saying, The Philistines have returned the ark. Come get it and take it to your place. And so they did. And it was there for a long time. And this really is a short scene, but it comprises the, the fourth scene of what's happening here. And it's the ark versus the Israelites. God is not only willing to fight against the pagans, the, the Gentiles, the non-Israelites who don't respect him, but if the Israelites don't respect him, they're going to find themselves in the same situation. And we move from this to, uh, to Samuel. So Eli is officially out. And the next narrative, which is at the beginning of chapter 7, is Samuel is officially in. A long story short, Samuel actually calls the people away from their idolatry back to repentance before the Lord and takes this as an opportunity to tell them that you guys are actually experiencing these things because you're not right before the Lord. And so it says in, in verse, uh, verse 2 of chapter 7, all the people of Israel turned back to the Lord. And so he said to them, if you're going to return to the Lord with all your hearts, then rid yourselves of the foreign gods and the asterisks and commit yourself to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. And that is precisely what they do. They, they put away their idols and they serve the Lord only. And, and then Samuel prays for them and things are well. And then actually we end where we begin with another battle. You may recognize the name of this one. This comes to be known as the Battle of Ebenezer. And the reason it's called Ebenezer is because the Israelites win because the Lord helps them. And that's what the word Ebenezer means. And so after this battle uh, in which Samuel had offered a burnt sacrifice to the Lord for the people and the Lord answered with thunder and the Philistines were thrown into chaos and, and they win. And it says in chapter 7, verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. And then we get a bit of a description. This will be the last portion of our text for today. So, so the Philistines were subdued and they stopped invading Israel's territory. Throughout Samuel's lifetime, the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines. The towns from Ekron to Gath that the Philistines had captured from Israel were restored to Israel, and Israel delivered the neighboring territory from the hand of the Philistines, and there was peace, peace between Israel and the Amorites. We then find this description of Samuel, who continued as Israel's leader all the days of his life. From year to year, he went on a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mizpah, judging Israel in all those places, but he always went back to Ramah, where his home was, and there he also held court for Israel, and he built an altar there to the Lord." So you notice that we have actually, maybe have already detected it, not just a random selection of events, but something of a pattern. So at the beginning, at the very end, you have these battles. And in between these battles, you have the transition in leadership. And in the middle of this story, you have the adventures of the Ark of God. That's what we see taking place in this story. So, okay, what do we need to hear from these particular events? Well, I suppose there's any number of things we could learn from this, but let me just by way of reflecting on this together for a moment, point out some of the more obvious ones. I think probably one of the things that we must indeed learn from this story is that God will not be used by us. The Israelites thought that they could just grab the thing that had worked in the past and throw it out there again. If we just say the right words and go through the right motions, then surely God is going to deliver us. This is not faith. This is a, this is treating God like a, like a, like a talisman, like a, like a magical object. This is Treating God like a genie in a bottle. If you just you know, rub the bottle the right way, then out comes the genie and poof, he gives us what we want. And it's very clear in the story that we, <laughs> we cannot manipulate God for our own purposes. It's not going to work. That's an important thing, of course, for us to remember, but just as equally important is the recognition that God does not need us. So we don't get to use him and he doesn't really need us. I mean, to put it in modern terms, God is not codependent. God is not depending on us to be who he is. God is not worried about whether or not his people do precisely what he wants or else his whole plan is going to get thrown off course. No, God is fine. He's sovereign. He can handle things on his own. He would prefer to work through us for sure, but he doesn't, he doesn't need us. I love noticing what God does here. Honestly, it's, there's an intentionality to it. If you, if you look closely, it's, you know, we credit the Greeks with the Trojan horse. This seems to me like the original Trojan horse move. Like, what does God ultimately want to do for the people? Well, he wants to deliver them from the Philistines by exacting judgment on the Philistines for their idolatry and oppression. And so he literally does this as well as could be hoped. 
He, like the famous Trojan horse, demonstrates himself as if defeated, and then just in the moment when you think that you've won, he actually shows himself to be victorious, and he takes down not only one, not only two, but three of the Philistine cities. He has defeated a majority of them, and in the process, he has literally toppled and dismembered their God, who needs them. God, I think, demonstrates himself very clearly to be a God who is happy to use us, but does not need us, and honestly, both of these things that idea that we might be tempted to use God and the idea that we might be tempted to think that God needs us, well, the upshot of both of those is we probably ought to repent. We probably ought to recognize the ways in which we've approached God that do not honor God for who he is and turn away from those ways of thinking and the ways of living that correspond to them. And this, though, is the good news because you don't just see bad news here. You also see the fact that God seems willing to bless all who repent. Yes, God will judge all equally who mishonor his name, but he also will offer blessing upon those who repent. When the Philistines acknowledged their sin and provided a guilt offering to show they recognized the wrong of what they'd done, he relented. When the Israelites are putting away their Baals and Ashtoreths and four false gods, he, he delivers them. And so you notice that this God is certainly willing to bless all who repent. And so we see some events and we hear some important lessons. And yet there's one more question I think we need to ask. And it's not so much a question of what, but who. Who else do we see when we look closely at this story? Abandoned by the people Israel who fled when he did not fight as they thought he should. God himself goes alone to the throne of evil and there he proves victorious over the powers of evil at the very location where he appears most defeated. Same story, second verse. Abandoned by his disciples who fled when he didn't fight as they thought he should, Christ goes alone to the throne of evil and precisely there he proves victorious over the powers of evil in the very place where it appears he is most defeated. There's more. How did he win this victory over the powers of evil? Well, you know the truth, and it's just as true now when you first believe, by entering into the sacred presence and taking upon himself the penalty for our sin. What happens here? Look again at what happens in 1 Samuel 4 through 7. What is the penalty for turning back on Yahweh according to the code that he had given them in Deuteronomy, according to the law? Uh, the penalty for turning your back on Yahweh is that the people will go into exile. But the people don't go into exile, do they? No, no, in this case, Yahweh goes into exile on their behalf, imposing upon himself the burden as it des that is designated for them. This is victory through self-substitutionary sacrifice. This is Romans 3. This is 2 Corinthians 5. This is Colossians 2, that in offering himself as, as taking upon the penalty for our sin that we see in his own body, the charge of our legal indebtedness, and that's what was nailed to the cross. And it is in this way that he triumphs over the powers of evil. Evil is no match for the Lord, and you and I are offered the blessings of his victory, which are reserved not for those who earn, but for those who repentantly receive.